Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you again to this evening's FameLab Ireland final. On behalf of British Council in Ireland, I want to say thank you and welcome to our participants, our judges, our hosts, and especially you, our audience. And thank you for your patience and support as we recently overcame some technical challenges. This is the seventh year of FameLab in Ireland, and we're always really pleased to meet a new cohort of FameLabbers each year and journey with them as they discover science communication for themselves. As well as being the seventh year of FameLab, it's also British Council in Ireland's 30th anniversary. It's been a really interesting time for us to look back at the partnerships and connections we have brokered in science, in higher education and the arts. Can I say a special word of welcome to any of our FameLab international community who have tuned in this evening. FameLab is a partnership between the British Council and Cheltenham Festivals and takes place in more than 30 countries around the world. At this difficult time for many millions of people, it's always nice to be reminded of the international communities and networks that we are all a part of, even if we can only participate virtually for now. Before I hand over to our host, Jonathan McRae, can I say a couple of thank yous? To Science Foundation Ireland, CPL Resources and Henkel Ireland, many thanks for enabling not just this evening's event, but the rest of the resources, events and opportunities that happen for our FameLab participants and our FameLab alumni throughout the year. To our higher education partners and to our media partner, Newstalk 106 to 108 FM, thank you so much. To our very wise and very patient judges, thank you indeed. And to our brilliant interval act, Eamon McGuire, who you'll meet shortly. Can I also say a huge thank you to my own colleagues in British Council Ireland, Liz, Aoife and Isalu, who have worked incredibly hard to make this evening happen, but who also shepherd FameLab as well as the rest of our programme in science, higher education and arts throughout the year. Right, time for me to get out of the way and hand over to our host, Jonathan McRae. Jonathan, this year, as every year, has been a vital part of the FameLab Ireland family. He is a man of infinite patience, infinite professionalism and infinite puns. Over to you, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much, Mags, and welcome to all of you to this, the Facebook Live version of the FameLab Ireland final. As Mags said, I'm Jonathan McRae from News Talks Future Proof, and I will be your host and MC for this evening. Uh, please do comment and like underneath. We'd love to hear your thoughts as we take you through an evening of entertainment, spills, and thrills as we hear from 10 of the FameLab Ireland finalists as they present a talk of three minutes in which they attempt to wow our judges. And the idea of FameLab is fairly simple. You get on stage and you bring only what you can carry with you onto it. In this case, I suppose it's what you can fit within the screen. And you've three minutes to deliver uh, a new idea or an old idea, something from the world of science, technology, engineering, and maths in a way that enthralls the audience. And they'll be judged by our judges and our, our audience at home as well on their performance. And one will go through to the Cheltenham Fame Lab final, uh, which is a, a very special event indeed. Um, as Mike said, this is the seventh year in Ireland and I've been a part of uh, Fame Lab since then and enjoyed watching all of these uh, budding uh, communicators uh, really get their ideas out there in the open. So I hope you enjoy this evening, uh, so sit back and relax uh, and enjoy the show. Um, this competition, of course, uh, needs proper regiment it needs proper scrutiny and to do that we have three of the finest judges uh, we could possibly find uh Gillian burke is our first judge from maggot farming to television presenting she's a biologist and bbc spring watch presenter uh, she's followed an unusual career path from a childhood in kenya to joining one of britain's best loved wildlife television shows she may be passionate about the natural world but she's increasingly curious and drawn to human stories of behavior change as a science communicator and environmentalist she believes that things can change for the better. Please welcome Gillian Burke. Hi there. Um, our second judge is Judith Moffat. She holds a position of director at CPL Group and is responsible for CPL's technical divisions across pharma, biotech, medical device, engineering, construction, and supply chain. She's been in CPL for 15 years and has been a regular FameLab judge. Uh, she is a BSc in biology and chemistry, an MSc in science communication, and a diploma in effective management. So she knows her stuff. Please welcome Judith Moffat. Hi, everybody. Delighted to be here. Really looking forward to it this evening. And our final judge is uh, Niall Smith. Niall Smith studied astrophysics at UCD and graduated with his PCD 
PhD in 1990. He lectured in the Department of Applied Physics and Instrumentation in Cork Institute of Technology for 18 years before becoming the Institute's first head of research in 2005, although he looks very young to have achieved that so, so long ago. Now, as the founder director of the internationally award-winning Blackrock Castle Observatory, which is about to celebrate its 13th anniversary in his spare time, Niall is a keen ball dancer and enjoys crime dramas. Niall, welcome to the judging panel. And it's great to be here. We're looking forward to this. I can't wait. So let me take you through the rules. There are, as I said, 10 contestants. Each will have three minutes. If they go past three minutes, a warning sound will be uh, alerted and you must finish. Our judges will then have two or three minutes to uh, go through questions and comments. Um, the judges will then deliberate once we've heard all of those talks for 15 minutes and evaluate uh, the good, the bad, separate the, the chaff from the wheat. Uh, and you will get your chance to vote too. So uh, during uh, the break, when we have an intermission, we're going to hear from uh, comedian and science communicator, Emer Maguire. You'll get your chance to say who you think should be the winner of FameLab Ireland 2020. Now, it is a very difficult thing to do this and it, we are in a virtual world. So uh, we're hoping for lots of likes and thumbs up and em emojis uh, for our uh, performers this evening. Give them as much virtual support as you can because it's hard to deliver uh, to uh, a screen. And usually we feed off the, the energy of a live audience. So this is a tricky thing to do. So good luck to all of our contestants and let's kick off, shall we? Our first speaker is Helen Horkin. She completed her BSc in medical genetics in the rainy north of England and decided to follow the rain to Galway to undertake a PhD at NUIG. She is part of Science Foundation Ireland's first cohort in the Centre for Research Training in Genomic Data Science and working in Professor Yuri Frank's lab. She's now looking at how an immortal animal repairs its DNA. In her spare time, she loves rock climbing and is an international roller derby referee, which I wasn't sure if it was a real thing, but I had to Google and indeed it is. And she's telling the truth. Uh, it's essentially a sport, kind of like assault on roller skates. It's the best way I can describe it. You should check it out. Um, will she emerge from this competition unscathed? Though? That's the question. It's time to blow the whistle and find out. Please welcome our first FameLab Ireland 2020 contestant, Helen Horkin. So when I ask you why we die, you think it's obvious, right? Injury, illness, disease. And you're right, they're all big players. But what about the death that we all want? The good death. When you're sound asleep in your bed at night, passing away peacefully after a long, rich life, dying of old age, of natural causes. But what does that even mean, natural causes? Surely there must be an underlying reason. Imagine you did everything perfectly. No smoking, no drinking, no eating to excess and loads of exercise. Eventually you'd still die. We all do. See, as we grow and age, we must make new cells. And every new cell that we make is a copy of an old one. Inside your cells is your DNA. That's your genetic blueprint. And it's organized nicely into 46 chromosomes, which look a bit like this. So every time you make a new cell, you've got to copy all 46 of these. That's a big job. So most of the time there's errors. Bits get chopped off at the ends, bits get middled up in the middle. Just think of it like photocopying an image and then copying the copy and then copying that copy again and again, thousands of times until eventually what you're left with looks nothing like what you started with. Well, that's what happens with your DNA. Eventually, it gets so short or so muddled that your body can no longer use it to make healthy cells. And that's when you begin to deteriorate. At first, it's small things like your eyesight, but eventually it's big things like your heart, until one day it stops beating. Now, there's some animals that can copy their DNA almost perfectly. They never age and they don't die. So wouldn't it be great to be like them? Well, maybe not. See, we also imperfectly copy our DNA into our eggs and into our sperm, and they go on to make our children. And now you're thinking, she's got to be crazy, right? Why on earth would we want our children to have DNA with errors in it? Well, in the scientific community, we don't actually call them errors. We call them mutations. And mutations give rise to chance. The chance that your child might have better eyesight, that my child might have a stronger heart, that somebody else's child 
might have resistance to a deadly bacteria. See, the chance of mutation in our DNA is what drives evolution. In the time since we left the oceans, left the caves, learnt to farm, created vaccines, those jellyfish that can perfectly copy their DNA have remained in the sea. See, our mechanism for copying our DNA is not imperfect. It's perfectly imperfect. Our good death is the reason we live a good life. We've got to die so that our children's children's children can live a life better than ours was. We're quite literally dying to evolve. And we have some cheesy canned laughter as well. Brilliant. Uh, very well done, Helen. Let's hear from our judges. What do our judges think? Well, I'm, I'll jump in then. Sorry, um, Julian, you, you go first. Oh, sorry. I couldn't see who was going to go. I, this is going to happen a lot, isn't it? It is. It is. We're too oh, enthusiastic. Yeah. I had that thing of like, oh, there's too much silence. I'll say something quick. <laughs> anyway, Helen, well done. Uh, that was really, really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, my question really was um, maybe more of a content question, which I just wondered um, within all of that explanation, why some animals uh, or some organisms have very short lifespans, um, particularly if you look like in the same animal group, like mammals, for example, there's this huge variation in lifespan. So how does that fit in with your explanation about the good death? Um, I suppose that my point of view is that I work with DNA damage response. So I look at how they repair errors in their DNA and how they copy their DNA without errors in it. Um, so my view of aging and death is from the point of view of copying our DNA perfectly. But that's not the only thing that the length of our life is based around. So it can be based around a lot of things, um, largely DNA damage, which is what causes deterioration of our cells but also based around like how quickly we can procreate. So it's really important in animals like flies that can create children really quickly, that there's still enough um, in the environment to support the animal. So it's more than just repairing breaks in the DNA that uh, leads to your lifespan. And can I ask actually, Helen, if, if the mutations are, I'd say, largely random, what, what, why do we end up with smarter? Why does it not sort of naturally just become the same sort of level of intelligence or something? Like we seem to have, we've seen mutated, but yet got better. How does, how does that work? Uh, so like you say, muta mutations are random. So the mutations happen at random. But um, the reason that the mutations stay is not always random. So there's a thing called selection pressures. So for example, if you take birds that have got like specifically long beaks, they may have got a random mutation that gives them the long beak, but that might mean that they have an advantage in gaining food, meaning that they survive better and then they pass on that mutation to their children. So just thank you very much, uh, Helen Horkin. Jonathan, can I ask yeah. one more quick sure, question? Sure. Very quick, because I loved it. Helen, well done. That was fantastic. Um, and I think it was quite poignant the way you were talking about um, that were the, the way it's done, it's perfectly imperfect. And it brought to mind a film, Gattaca, from many years ago that I watched. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on the social implications of this, of the era of designer babies versus naturally conceived children. Have you thought about the ethics of that? Yeah, I personally think that it's really difficult. And I think that a lot of the general population, um, when they think of it on a surface level, they're all for the idea of being able to get rid of diseases and things like that and tune them out of the population. But for the majority of the people that work in the field, we're aware of what a moral conundrum that would be and how variety is the spice of life. And um, the things that people consider something that's undesirable isn't necessarily what is undesirable. And it's what makes us so amazing as, as a species that we're all so different and all over the world. Great answer. Thank you. Well, was Helen perfect, imperfect, or perfectly imperfect? Only time will tell. Let's move on to our second speaker. Uh, Connor Duffy's talk is called Born to Run, How Culture is Written into Our Biology. Uh, Connor is a third year PhD student in the RCSI, where he is the resident neuroscience in Dr. Claire McCoy's immunology research group. His work focuses on MS and how manipulating the expression of genes could be a promising avenue for new treatments. Outside of the lab, Connor has a deep appreciation for bees. Will his night end with a buzz or will it have a sting in the tail? Give a swarm welcome. Okay, no, no more bad puns. I'll be hive. 
Please welcome Conor Duffy. To stay active while isolating to starve the virus, a lot of us have taken up running within our two kilometre zone, of course. We're playing to our strengths here because humans are among the best endurance runners in the animal kingdom. Our bodies have a whole host of adaptations, from long legs that can take big, efficient strides to reinforced joints that can absorb multiple impacts. But the most impressive is basically unique to us, and that's our ability to sweat. Humans are by far the sweatiest species. Our smooth, almost hairless skin is absolutely peppered with sweat glands that releases liquid onto the surface of our skin, which evaporates away the heat that's generated while running. No other animal can cool as effectively as us by sweating, and this was an essential advantage in the African savannas of our evolutionary past. Our sweaty skin meant that we could remain cool in the blistering heat of the midday sun, where we engaged in persistence hunting, literally running down some sadly sub-sweaty prey for up to five hours to the point of exhaustion and heat stroke. Meanwhile, Simba and his pride, who just can't keep their cool, would be forced to wait until the evening. But there's a catch. This impressive cooling system needs a steady supply of water. An athlete at full clip can easily lose two, even three liters of water an hour to sweating. But any marathon runner will tell you that our bodies just can't store enough water to keep that up for hours and hours in the heat. We need to be able to rehydrate on the go to keep the sweat switched on. This is where culture, our collective knowledge comes in. Our unique cooling system could evolve because of a very clever innovation. Putting your water into a container and carrying that with you. In the Kalahari Desert, for example, persistence hunters stay hydrated by fashioning ostrich eggs and antelope stomach sacs into water containers, allowing them to quench their thirst while chasing down prey. They also have the local know-how to find water that's stored in hollow tree trucks which they suck out with reed straws. This combination of shared knowledge and the tools to use it supply the essential ingredients needed to develop a sophisticated cooling system, water. This suggests that our incredible biological capacity for endurance running actually required culture to evolve. The existence of tools in our hands and knowledge in our heads had reshaped our biology and that made us ah! The sweaty kings of the savannah. So if you're ever wondering if all of our modern technology is changing who we are as human beings, then go off for a run. But it won't be your phone slapping out spring sleep that's to blame. It's your bottle of water that's already left its mark on our humanity a very long time ago. And that, baby, is how we were born to run. Excellent work, kind of. You're actually making me thirsty. Uh, brilliant talk uh, and excellent outfit as well. Although, who runs to Priest Springsteen? Uh, let's go to our judges. And uh, can, I we'll go to, yeah. can I? Yeah, as 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 Julian said, this might happen on the odd occasion. But I was just just really interested in what happens in regions which are very humid and where the ability to sweat or get rid of the the water is less. Do, do people have run less? Do they have different ways of hunting? What, what happens when you're not in the dry savanna? Well, yeah, that's a very good question because um, this, what, like it's, it's considered that this system probably a big part of how it was able to evolve was because of the dry savanna, which makes sweating very efficient because the less humid the air is, the more readily it'll evaporate away. So, you know, part of how this evolved was also the location of our ancestors. And as humans moved out of the African savanna, yeah, new things had to be, um, new hunting techniques had to be developed. But this was what, this was kind of the, um, this was kind of the core, the start of it, that led to humans being such good runners. But of course, then if you're in colder areas, you can run more without overheating, but then other predators can also do that. So it was less of a critical advantage. Very good, thank you. Judith or Gillian? Yeah, um, yeah, very interesting. Although I have to say, 
I've never thought of humans as being particularly sort of gifted as um, anything other than perhaps maybe, you know, our ability to be social and clever, but endurance. I'm thinking of things like, you know, wild dogs or even wolves. Like there's several more other species I think of as real endurance specialists. Are we really better than them? So um, I will say there was a brilliant paper that I read while I was researching this talk. It was written in 2007, and it actually postulated if you gave a human enough water and the race happened during the middle of the day, a human would be able to beat a horse at a marathon because our endurance running is actually, that is how good we are at it. Over marathon level distances, that kind of five hours of running, we really are the best. And so like, yeah, if you want to, you know, if you want to race a pack of wolves, do it during the middle of the day and they won't be able to uh, keep up with you over a marathon distance. And yes, it is again, not something you'd think of, but humans really are among the very best endurance runners on the planet. <laughs> Wow, I did not know that. Judith, do you have something for Connor? Yeah, or shall I, let I him... do. No, I do. I, a quick one, Connor. Really well done. That's really interesting. Um, I have a left field question, as I see with the bottle, and I know it's a, obviously a sustainable bottle, but do you think we've taken the whole concept of having water with us constantly to, to extreme levels with the level of plastic in the world? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I suppose that's... Um... I suppose that's an issue of how, like, what exactly we use to store our water so that we can use our great sweaty system. I mean, uh, like, as I say, the uh, Kalahari hunters were great recyclers, you know, they used discarded ostrich eggs and antelope stomach sacks, you know, they were really using everything that they had. So, um, yeah, if we want to kind of um, keep up being the kings of the savannah without destroying the environment, yeah, we'll need to kind of use our sustainable ways of doing it instead of just, you know, disposable plastic stuff. <laughs> Great answer, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not convinced by this seven liters a day or however many, I don't know if there's good science behind it. Do, 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 we, know, do we know about that, Connor? Do we know is there good, good science behind the amount of water we should be drinking a day? No, and yeah, um, that's, uh, no, like, that is notoriously something that we don't know <laughs> exactly how much water we need to consume every day. Um, yeah, you, we know, kind of, we have a sense of how much is too little, um, but uh, how much do we actually need? Like, you know, the kind of ballpark is, eight glasses of water but it's you know it's really it, there's so much like local circumstance that would come into us that yeah we we don't have a very solid handle on it but it's probably better to have a little bit too much than a little bit too less Connor Duffery everyone thanks Connor uh, our next talk is from Sandra Hurley it's called Don't Fence Me In and Sandra is originally from Holland so she snuck into the famed Lab Ireland final uh, she married an Irishman and that's how she arrived on this island she uh, is a trained artist and she worked in primary schools under the Artists in School scheme, which was funded by the Arts Council until the recession hit. She had to think again, and she decided to follow her passion for science and horses at the University of Limerick, where she got her BSc in equine science as a mature student. Uh, she's currently a PhD student doing research into the effect of the bit on equine behavior, welfare, and physiology. Is Sandra a grand national winner, or is she good for glue? It's a 10-horse race. Place your bets now. Please welcome Sandra Hurley. Imagine living in a tiny room. This is where you eat, sleep, and go to the toilets. You may be able to see others who are confined, just like you, but you won't be able to touch them or interact with them. So for 23 hours per day, you have no choice but to live in isolation. Once a day, you may leave this environment for exercise, but someone in authority has decided what you can do and where you may go. How will you cope if this situation continues? Did you think I was talking about the current situation we are in because of COVID-19? Well, I was actually talking about horses because for many horses, this is the reality in which they spend most of their lives. People often point out that today's horses are looked after very well. They are fed, they are kept safe, and of course, people love their horses. And that's true. But in spite of 6,000 years of domestication, horses are in essence still the same as their wild ancestors, social animals. You see, horses evolved to live in small groups roaming over large territories. Herd immunity to a horse means protection from predators, but the herd offers more than protection. Horses form friendships. They play together, they groom each other, and herd members may stay together for life. 
We humans are social animals too. And the drive to be together is so strong that we find it hard to observe the rules on lockdown. We're all chomping at the bit to get out of here, even though we know that it's for our own good. We have not evolved to live in isolation and we don't cope well. And it is well known that confinement and the loss of liberty have negative consequences for both physical and mental health. And it's no different for horses. Horses can get ulcers. They may develop behavioral problems. Some horses become difficult or even dangerous to handle, or they shut down and stop responding. And we have to remember that horses wouldn't build houses for themselves. So why do we stable them? Well, because it's convenient for us. It's tradition. And because we think it looks nice, a neat row of stables with horses' heads looking out. But there are alternative ways of keeping horses that facilitate their needs. We just need to think outside the box. Sometimes small changes can make huge differences. We don't like being locked up. Perhaps now we will finally understand what horses have been trying to tell us for ages. Don't fence me in. Hi, oh, Sandra, you know, I have a long list of things I feel bad about in the world. Now I have to add the welfare. Of horse. I never thought about it that way. Uh, great talk. Well done. Let's go to our judges. Oh, my God. Judges. Well, I'll kick off. So just a question. So the nature nurture bit. So if you're born with a stable as your home, uh, does that differ than if you are sort of introduced to it? And does there, is there a difference in the amount of sort of, of, of psychological or other um, issues that arise from horses that have known one thing and, and, and are, are, are you know, changed over to something else? Or how does that work? Good question. Well, horses are hardwired for certain things. So um, company is one of them. Horses are social animals and that's hardwired into them. So even if they're born in a stable, they are still going to need other horses. They are uh, genetically incapable of feeling safe in their, on their own because the fear of predators, of being the next lion's dinner is, is in there always. So horses on their own, for instance, will find it very hard to sleep. So they need other horses to look out for them. And being born in a stable has other consequences as well because horses are also evolved to spend most of the, of, of the day slowly moving, walking around and foraging. So they, they spend about 16 hours a day eating and they do that while they're constantly on the move. So those are all needs, of, even if they're born in a stable, they, that, you can't breathe it out of horses. We haven't been able to do that in all those years that we've been breeding horses. Okay, interesting, thank you. Andrew, can I ask, can I ask actually, really good talk, by the way, I love the way you brought it into, um, the way you brought it into today's COVID-19 situation, it's so relevant. Can I ask, what strategies would you recommend um, to make horses' lives better? Because it obviously it's a billion dollar industry for horse racing and show jumping and, you know, what can we do immediately or what has been done for horses' welfare? Yeah, so a very simple thing, for instance, would be to, um, uh, I know a yard where they have removed half the walls in between horses' stables. So now horses can actually stick their heads over the walls, they can groom each other, they can socialize. And that has made life much better for those horses. Another thing that works really well is group stabling. So instead of having individual small box stables in a large building, you could just have the horses in a group in the building. So um, those are ways that we can facilitate their social needs without opening the gates and sending them all off into wild nature right? because of course that's absolutely not possible in today's society. How do you um how do you tell if, if a horse is happy sounded? Does it wag its tail or does it smile or wink at you or how do you <laughs> <laughs> But we can see a lot more by the way they, they, they react if they're not happy. So right. horses are, are unhappy with their life. They tend to become depressed, basically, like human beings. So they might retreat. They might respond. They might not respond very well to us anymore. Uh, happy horses will pick their ears. They'll be interested in their environment. 
uh, they will respond to things happening around them, they will be interested in you as a human when you approach them. So horses that are depressed will stand in the back of the stable, they will respond to their name being called, anything like that. Uh, any other questions from our judges? Yeah, um, Sandra, thanks so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, one thing that struck me is, is actually more about your background, having moved across from arts to sciences. We tend to keep these things very separate. Like, you know, you can't be one without the, or, or the other. You have to be one or the other is what I'm trying to say. Um, I just wondered how much of your art background do you bring to your work and particularly in trying to communicate your ideas, your research and, and science? So I, I think that there is um, a link between the brain that you need to be a good scientist and the brain that you need to be a good artist. So you have to be creative, you have to be willing to look at new things or new ways of doing things, which are qualities that you, you would need that both as an artist or as a scientist. So I think I would bring those qualities um, to my, to, to my uh, research at the moment where I can look outside the box be creative about it, come up with new ideas and, and try and apply that to my work. Okay, well, Sandra Hurley's talk was Don't Fence Me In. Sandra, thank you very much. And thanks to our judges for their questions. Uh, Simon Spichak is next. Simon is an Irish Research Council uh, postgraduate scholar at University College Cork. He's interested in the non-neural neuronal cells in the brain, the microbial cells in the gut and how they communicate during early life. His talk is called I'm a Zombie and So Are You. That Simon is a zombie and still made it to the final is no reflection on the quality of talks from the Cork Heats this year. Uh, to be honest, though, the last five weeks have been such a horror show, I genuinely wouldn't be surprised if we suddenly saw the living dead rise from the grave and start doing snappy science talks with props. But I have a feeling Simon is being metaphorical. Let's find out, shall we? Simon Spichak, everyone. I'm a zombie, but don't you worry. There's no need to run off to the supermarket and buy up all the toilet paper. To hide in your secret underground bunker, of course, because you are a zombie too. Now, despite what all these books and TV shows and movies will have you believe about zombies, one teeny tiny little microbe can't control the human body. In actuality, it's actually trillions of microbes that are steadily pulling the strings. What do I mean? Well... Believe it or not, there's trillions of these teeny tiny bacteria and viruses and all kinds of microorganisms as diverse as the colors on my shirt that decide to move into our bodies, right? Now, a lot of them, in fact trillions, decide to move into our gastrointestinal tract because, as we all know, from real estate, the most important things are location, location, location. And boy, is the gastrointestinal tract a fantastic one. Because these microbes, not only do they live red free, but it's nice and warm in the gastrointestinal tract. And even better, when we eat food, sometimes our body doesn't digest it all. And these microbes that are there, they can actually digest some of this food such as the fibers you might find in the sourdough bread that you're cooking during a uh, lockdown. But aside from just eating your food and not paying rent, they can also metabolize these foods that we can't normally digest, and they can produce these molecules. They can produce a plethora, a cornucopia of these beautiful, diverse molecules, and a lot of these molecules can actually signal with the human body. Isn't that exciting? Can you believe that some of these molecules can help regulate our immune system development, our stress response, and they might be involved in our mood? In fact, there's so many different diseases where the microbes in the gut are clearly different than those in healthy people, indicating that the microbes in our gut might be important for a whole host of these diseases and disorders, including anxiety, depression, and neurodegenerative disease. In fact, we're trying to figure out how to use diet to change the microbes in our gut so that they can produce the molecules that we need to improve our mental health. Thank you. This has been a message from a trillion microbes in a man suit. <laughs> 
Well done, Simon. I have to say, I love the, the color palette and the shirt. It made it very much, you know, I was thinking George A. Romero, early 80s, fantastic. Uh, let's hear from our judges. So, uh, Jillian. Oh, hang on, just uh, mute myself. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, that was incredibly engaging. Um, I just wondered if you could um, almost take a, a step back from what you were talking about and just paint the picture for me in terms of, um, you know, how this landscape might look internally, if, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. So let's just imagine we're being born. And as we're being born, we're completely sterile. But as we exit the birth canal, you have all of these microbes that can start living on the skin. They can go inside of our gut. And certain microbes, they can live in the gut and they receive different nutrients, for example, from breast milk. And they develop over the course of our lives from diet, from stress, and just about everything that we do there's always opportunity for microbes to come in. Now, if the community is healthy and stable, that means it's harder for a not so nice microbe to just, you know, walk in and kind of make its home there. So that's why it's really important that we stay healthy and that we're mindful of all these things that can actually change what lives inside of our guts. Judith, so can I ask? Yeah. Sorry, can I ask a question then? Something on that. So you know, you often hear of drink this and you're sorted. Probiotic this or do that's the silver bullet. This is just what you need for your gut. So what what's the current thinking on the silver bullet, uh, or is there one, or does one silver bullet be the the, the lead bullet for some other poor microbe that's in your gut? Well, the exciting thing for me and the frustrating thing for everyone else is that we actually don't know yet. This field is still in the infancy. But what we do know is that we can actually use this to treat uh, antibiotic resistant C. difficile infection. We haven't really gone to the point where we can say, take this probiotic and it'll improve your mental health. There's a few studies that show that there might be some mild positive effects, but it's really hard to run these studies on humans because A, you have to get a bunch of people together and to adhere to a strict protocol, and B, you have to get them to agree to give you their poop to analyze, which, which, which is a little tricky. Uh, right now, there's actually a clinical trial going on for a gut-targeted intervention for Alzheimer's disease called oligomanate that's thought to work through the immune system. So we'll see if that will end up being fruitful. Otherwise, it's back to the drawing board. Great, thank you. Judith, the question for me or shall I move on? Just a quick one, Simon, well done. That was very dramatic, very scary actually as well. <laughs> um, just on that, like you mentioned some diseases that are linked to the, um, you know, to the microbes in the gut. Could you take us through an example of that? Sure. Let's, uh, let's talk about uh, something like Alzheimer's disease. So with Alzheimer's disease, it's one of the most common neurodegenerative disorders and the most common cause of dementia in the older population. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease is the diet gets a lot less diverse. And as well, there's some issues in individuals and they have some gut symptoms. The, uh, the combination of those two, they dysregulate the microbes. So for example, if you look at how many different kinds of microbes are in the guts of people with Alzheimer's versus people without, the kinds of microbes and the amounts that these microbes are present in are very different. Now, because there's so many differences in how studies are run, it's been hard so far to pinpoint specific microbes. But the thing is, just having a dysregulated landscape there means that any old microbe can come in and it can uh, make its home in the gut, even if you don't want it there in the gut. We don't know the cause and effect yet, but it's clear that 
the increase in uh, the lack of stability in the microbiome is a contributor to the disease state. Simon and judges, thank you very much. Simon, speech check, everyone. Uh, our next speaker is Marina Mulligan. She is a conservation conservation biologist who has previously researched rainforest species and the bioacoustics of birdsong. Her background includes a BSc in zoology and MSc with the University of Exeter, uh, with a huge interest in communicating science to the public. She hopes to inspire people to take their own actions against biodiversity loss. Her talk is called Deciphering the True Meaning of Tweets. Uh, when she finishes her talk, will she be proud as a peacock, peacock or will her dreams be... Or will her dreams of winning be dead as a dodo? Flap your wings, please, for Marina Mulligan. What's in a tweet? Short and sweet with a profound meaning or on closer inspection, an indicator of intelligence, deterioration, or just fake news. Today, I want to bring you into a realm where tech and physics meet biology in the natural world. More specifically, the world of bioacoustics, where scientists study the sounds produced and heard by different species to uncover their hidden meanings. From bats, birds and frogs to insects, fish and primates, the sounds of different species can depict not only the information on the behaviours and movements of an animal, but also on the health of the habitats they live in. The tweets that I'm talking about today are in the bird world. So, close your eyes for a moment. This is the sound of a great tit, or to be more precise, a male great tit territorial call. The familiar garden bird has a black head, white cheeks, and a black stripe down its greenish body. Its widespread distribution means that this call, the teacher call, can be heard over three continents, from Western Europe and Morocco, right to the south of Indonesia. Birds, like humans, pick up sounds from their parents. First, they start to babble as chicks, learn notes, syllables and song structure before heading out into the big bad world as fledglings. Here, they're armed with a repertoire of 70 well-produced calls by their perfectionist parents. However, most great tits sing their eight favourite songs on repeat. Tuning into birdsong is much like tuning into a radio station though. The great tit sings within a frequency range of about 2 to 9 kilohertz and this can be picked up on mics transferred onto software and analysed. My study of great tits in the Pyrenees found that out of four subpopulations, one population, the townies, used a completely different frequency to the other three, giving them a different dialect or accent. Further to this, my townies preferred actually not to mix with the other three populations, and a reason, number of reasons can exist for this. Higher altitude males were using high frequencies and short songs, while my tiny population were using low frequencies and long songs, so maybe they were lost in translation. Whatever the reason, the great tit is a brilliant example of an indicator species in bioacoustics. As it is common and not threatened, it holds the potential to give us loads of information on changing climates, fragmented populations, and song change within habitats before the consequences are visible to us. In cities, this man-made noise can mask frequencies used by songbirds, Gulls and jackdaws can cut through this noise using low frequencies. However, songbirds using high frequencies and with a short stage of learning are not so lucky. All in all, the study of bioacoustics in common species can hold a wealth of information that just needs a little more digging to find out the true meaning behind the tweet. Thank you. I love that, Marina, because I'm literally looking at uh, my bird feeder outside my window as I, I broadcast this from, from my shed. And I, we have great tits, we have blue tits, we've got finches. Uh, so love that talk. Really, really good. Let's hear from our judges. Okay. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely going to get a lot of people excited. Um, Marina, I have a question, though. Um, certainly right now with so many um, cities, urban environments and lockdown, um, this has been a very, very unique spring in terms of the ambient sound and man-made sound. How quickly can um, particularly our songbirds respond to this kind of change? They actually respond quite fast. Um, and even if we look at Dublin City as an example, the lack of noise pollution at the moment means that there's a lot of construction that isn't going on. There's a lot of infrasound and ultrasound there that we're unaware of um, and that birds can really tune into and we can't hear. So at the moment, even on an anecdotal level, if the habitat is there, the birds will find it. 
Um, so urban parks at the moment have huge stone choruses happening. There's birds coming back into housing estates where trees are available just because they can they can shout over the sound essentially. Now it doesn't mean that nature is coming back and I think that's a really important thing to say um, but it does mean that they're able to adapt but the habitat has to be there. Um, so concrete really isn't the best for songbirds. Niall Judith? Yeah, just uh, I was interested in the, the low frequency and the high frequency. Is there any sense of any type of information being carried? Uh, I mean, and I'm thinking low frequency, sort of lower bandwidth of transfer information, higher frequency. Is, are they using anything like this to, to, to tell us more than just this very pretty? By the way, we have an amazing Don chorus here as well at the moment. It's just, it's just it is stunning. But is there more information carried in the high frequency versus low frequency or what, what way does that maybe work? Yeah, so there's a number of ways it works. Um, with the calls that I studied specifically, I chose to use the male territorial great tick call because it's very iconic. We know what the meaning of the sound is. So we know that it's used for territory and we know that it's used for attracting mates. Um, and the reason with frequency changes between higher altitude males, first of all, the air is slightly thinner. Um, so if you produce a really high frequency sound, it can actually travel further than it would normally um, where the air is, is more dense. Um, on top of that as well, there was the issue of maybe attenuation. So if you're down in an urban habitat where there's lots of obstacles in the way, those sound waves are actually hitting off obstacles all the time. And your low frequency bandwidth will push through a lot of that, I guess, extra extra obstacles, whereas your high frequency won't. And what we did find was with the lower towny population that they were able to use these low frequencies to push through and they were passing that on to their young. However, the high frequency males and the high frequency individuals in high altitudes, if they were to move down and try and breed with the lower, lower, fre lower frequency population, um, they actually didn't have the ability to adapt their song to survive in that situation. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. Thanks very much uh, for that, Marina. Uh, we are five talks down and five to go. Uh, our next speaker is Catherine Burns. Her talk is called Everyone Hates Wasps. Uh, Katie is an Irish Research Council postgraduate research at the Stanley Ecology Lab at UCD. Uh, her main interests in research are the public processions of pollinators, crop pollination, pollinator conservation, and interactions between managed and wild pollinators. Pollinators, as you know, are quite diverse. They're ants, wasps, beetles, and you could say lepidopter, lepidopter le butterflies. Uh, I know her full family is pollen for her. Here's hoping Catherine burns the house down with K fever. It's Catherine. I'm guessing that you've thought at least once in your life that the world would be better without wasps and you wouldn't be alone. In 2018, it was scientifically proven that pretty much everyone hates wasps, including people who study insects for a living. And as a result, there is a huge gap in the research on wasps because literally no one wants to study them. So I think it's pretty clear that wasps need a major image upgrade. So let's talk about wasps. The most recognizable wasps are social wasps who live in large groups and look like female supervillains in latex suits. These social wasps live in groups made up of a queen and her female workers, much like our beloved honeybees and bumblebees. In the spring and early summer, these workers are busy collecting food to feed the colony's larvae, or baby wasps. Unlike bees who collect pollen and are basically just vegetarian wasps, these ladies prey on other insects to feed their larvae. And by eating the insect that might munch on garden plants or crops, they end up providing gardeners and farmers with the free service of pest control. Also, when they visit these flowers to either take a sip of nectar or eat a pest, they get pollen stuck to their bodies and end up pollinating the flowers, just like bees. In the late summer, we start to really notice wasps because they're bored and they're hungry. The queen has died, all of the larvae have grown up, and these workers are left to fend for themselves, which means that they're going to seek out easy sources of protein and sugar, like dead animals or rotting fruit. 
And this scavenging behavior is great for picking up nature's messes, but not so great when you're trying to enjoy a ham sandwich and a soda on a sunny day. Unfortunately, it all looks the same to a wasp. But despite their bad behavior, these ladies do not have a personal vendetta against you. They're predators, which is why they're so reactive and more likely to pack a mean sting. I'm guessing that you think predators like wolves or tigers are pretty cool, but I doubt you'd want them stalking your lunch either. If a wasp is bothering you, I recommend either walking confidently away or throwing a piece of your sandwich to the side for them to chase down. They're much more interested in food than in you. The bottom line is, when it comes to wasps, it's totally okay to be afraid of them, but you don't have to call pest control when you find their nests. They're doing a lot for this fragile planet of ours in terms of their role as a predator, a pollinator, and a scavenger, which in my opinion, makes them just as badass as a tiger and deserving of our patience, not our hate. Thank you. Fantastic job, Katie. Well done. All right, uh, Katie's got a bit of a problem with her uh, video feed, so we're going to get audio only, but you know what she looks like, you've seen the talk. Let's go to our judges. Katie, how are you? Well done. Really good talk. Um, my question is, um, what do you do if you find a wasp nest in your roof? I'm conscious, you know, we want to be environmentally friendly. So what's your advice on that? Well, um, I always say prevention is sort of the best medicine for this. So sort of keeping an eye in the spring and early summer on places with like your sheds and in your back garden to see if you can see the beginnings of wasp nests beginning to form. They look a little like paper mache. And if you can get them early, then you can actually get them in a jar and move them to somewhere else um, or find someone brave enough to do that. But of course, if it's all up in your walls or something, I always follow the rule. If you're in my habitat, you have to go. And if I can do it peacefully, I will. But, you know, sometimes you kind of have to do what you got to do. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks, Phil. Brutal, Katie. Brutal. Uh, what about <laughs> what about no? I leave a question about stings. Yeah, Katie. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah. Well, I, I I mean I'm going to ask the question. Maybe the premise of it is wrong, but I I was always under when we were kids. We were always told that a wasp stings once, and uh, you know then it dies or whatever. Now, if that's incorrect, then then the, the the premise of the question is incorrect. But what would be the rationale for that um, it, it, for any animal in the sense that it could give you a little bit of a bite and then run away as a sting from do something more dangerous but die. Any, any sense of why do, they, why do they do that, which would be the reason why I don't like them, because I <laughs> sting. Yeah, so wasps can sting more than once. So it's actually only honeybees um, that get their stingers stuck because they have barbs. And so when they try and fly away, all their insides come out, which is grim. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the other ones, they can sting more than once. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a, for the predators at least, like wasps, it's just them being reactive the same way a dog would bite or something if it gets scared or it thinks it's under attack. Um, and actually, stingers are really interesting because only females have them in the Hymenoptera world, so all of the wasps and bees, because they actually evolve from their ovidepositors or their long tubes that lay eggs, which I always find like really kind of cool and ironic because I think if any woman could somehow evolve their reproductive bits to sting someone, I think that they would. Um, and that's, that's how to do it, so. Very good. <laughs> they have enough stings already, Katie, so <laughs> don't add to that. Is there a quick one from Gillian? Yeah, I don't know how to quite follow that, but I will. <laughs> um, yeah, Katie, I was just thinking, um, I, I love the way you, you pretty much managed to flip that with the start of your talk, when I started thinking of wasps as these like badass females and latex, I was like, I'm down for that. Um, but you know, maybe it's because I've got a, a 13 year old boy who's really into his wildlife, and I was thinking, how do how do we make that equally appealing? Um, you, you know, how do we bring in the male wasps into the story? Yeah, so male wasps are very important. They provide pretty much one function, and it's about what everyone can expect, but they're the reasons that we can have genetic diversity, so that's very important. They, like many males in the hymenopter world, just get kicked out of the nest as soon as they've fully formed, and they kind of have to fend for themselves until the new queens emerge. 
um, and then they fulfill their purpose, and then that's kind of it. But that's just how they're programmed. I, I don't think that they are too worried about it. Um, yeah, my sound went out a little when you asked that question, so I hope I answered it <laughs> as much as I could. You got that. Thank you so much. <laughs> It would appear we've lost Jonathan now. No, no, I'm I'm here. I'm sorry. It's just it's like a vampire's thing. I, I've got to lock out the sun before. So just bear with me. One, sorry about so, this. So, Kate, if you're sorry, can I ask a question? Then why do bees have their guts pulled out with a single thing? Then what's what? I, I guess the question just transfers to the bees rather than just the wasps. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I've kind of wondered that myself, and I'm sure there's a really great evolutionary answer out there. Um, I don't know, but it's great news for us because you know when you're approaching a honeybee hive, they're really only going to sting you if they really, really have to. I think that they're, a lot of people think if there's a bee anywhere around them in their vicinity, they're in danger of being stung. And that's why a lot of people do a lot of work to remove bumblebee nests or, you know, feral honeybee hives from, and wasp nests from their gardens because they're like, oh, they're going to sting my kids. But really, if they're busy foraging, like visiting flowers and things like that, they really have no desire to be anywhere near you. So um, that's one of the big things I try and do when I talk about bees, is sort of uh, quell that fear that they they don't want to be any closer to you than you do to them. So <laughs> thanks very much for that, Katie. Uh, that, Katie was our sixth speaker. We now have Joseph Pennycook. His talk is called "The Other Side of the Family." Um, after studying in Cornwall, Joe moved to Ireland to undertake his SFI funded PhD at UCC. Uh, he investigates the bacteria that live in the human gut and how they respond to antibiotics, but he's really interested in anything that lives. Uh, outside of the lab, Joe is an occasional jogger, but he's often found hanging around the couch because he is a semi-successful otter watcher. And an otter's home is called a couch, as you know. When you have to explain the joke, I suppose it's not really worth it. Uh, he's also a big board game fan, so it's time for Joe to roll the dice and begin his not-so-trivial pursuit of that number one spot in Fame Lab Ireland. Please welcome Joseph Pennycook. I'm going to try and convince you that you belong to a family you don't know about. But first, I need to explain the difference between human families and evolutionary families. Because studying evolution is really all about studying families, trying to work out who's most closely related to who, and which ancestors were the first to show traits that they passed on to their descendants. And both kinds of families can be organised into trees, but those family trees actually work pretty differently. Human family trees are all about combination. I have two parents, two families that came together to create me. But when we think about evolution, it mostly involves splitting apart. If you picture the famous tree of life, all the creatures on earth spreading outwards from a single trunk, the branches split, but they can never come together again. Two branches can never fuse back into one. And yet, in reality, they sort of can. One example of this is something called lichen, which is the mossy, mouldy stuff that you can find growing on old wood or stone that sometimes looks like chewing gum stepped into the pavement. Lichens might look like one living thing, but most are actually a fungus body housing a collection of algal cells. Two separate branches of life come together to create one creature. And there's no fungus in the world that can photosynthesize, harvesting energy from sunlight. No ancestors of fungus ever managed that. But lichen can, because it's not just a fungus, it's an algae as well. It belongs to both families. And the interesting thing is, lichen isn't that unusual. There are lots of creatures that live so closely together that they blur the lines between individuals. Some jellyfish, corals, sea anemones, all keep algae inside their bodies, just like lichen. And I study the human gut microbiome, which is the community of bacteria that lives inside the human gut. We're certainly not as closely connected to them as the two halves of lichen, but we're also not totally separate, because there are kinds of complicated sugars that you can find in onions, beans, all sorts of vegetables, that human evolution never figured out how to digest. Just like you can say that no fungus can photosynthesize, it's fair to say that no human can properly digest an onion. And yet, you can. You can eat an onion and digest it properly, because the bacteria in your gut do the hard work for you. If you think of yourself as a person who can digest an onion, that person isn't made of entirely human parts. So, there was some bacteria, somewhere in the distant past, that figured out a new way to feed itself by breaking those tricky sugars apart, 
And now its descendants do that inside your body every day. We think they give you 10% of your energy, keeping your mind racing, your lungs pumping, your heart beating. If you want to look back through the tree of life to find the origins of your lifestyle, you can't just look at the human branch, back through the apes and mammals and fish, because you won't find everything there that makes you, you. That's only one side of your family. Bacteria are the other. Thank you. You know, Richard Feynman famously said, you know, everything is interesting once you look closely enough. And, and I have to say, I did not know anything about that. Uh, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I'm liking that talk. Sorry, do you know what? Without the actual <laughs> groans from the, the live audience, these puns are dying. And I'm aware that I'm just going to keep going with them because they're in the script. Uh, brilliant talk, uh, Joseph. Let's go to our churches, shall we? Yeah, um, you know what? I, I want to say well done for tackling lichen and taxonomy in three minutes. <laughs> um, that, that is no mean feat. Um, one of the things that I liked about that was it sort of, like uh, you think, I think you used the words, blurred the boundaries, blurred the lines. Um, what I would be interested in is how, how would you place humans because i think t people tend to think of humans as sitting as on, on the uh, you know on the pinnacle of evolution um that's obviously not correct but how would you describe that in in your you know the way you do this yeah okay so in terms of the blurred lines i think an important distinction for lichens is that when lots of lichens reproduce the they keep their seeds together so the fungal spores are released at the same time as the algal spores the algae is inside the fungus spores and so they're completely on the same side at every point in their lives the fungus and algae are put together and so we're not quite on the same level as that as humans we're not quite as fused because most research at the moment i think would agree that when humans give birth they don't actually give birth with the microbes inside but there are incredible ways that, that parent humans give their microbes to child humans. So there's research at the moment that even shows that um, breast milk carries microbes with it. And not only does it carry microbes with it, but that those microbes are particularly good at digesting breast milk. So we give our babies not only microbes through our breast milk, but those microbes are particularly good at digesting the main food source that they're going to have for the first year of their life. So, so I think... Yeah, I would say in that level, lichens are ahead of us. There's certainly more, I guess there's there's different peaks. Um, lichen is at the peak of, of symbiosis maybe, but humans are at the peak of running and sweating, as we heard in Connor's talk. Lots of things are at different peaks. Any other questions from our judges? Yeah, J Joseph, uh, th thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I, I was just thinking when, when we were, when I was growing up, we were allowed to play around in the mud and the muck and then we stuck our fingers in our mouths all the time and there wasn't wipes everywhere and all the rest. What, 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 although my mum and my dad were, were, were appropriately clean. But um, what was the, what was the, uh, what's the, <laughs> if you like, on the balance? Because we seem to be coming into society now where, you know, we've got to clean down everything. Is that actually bad do we also bring in microbes from the environment that we need not just from say things like breast milk and so on what's what's kind of the sense on that yeah so this isn't something i've done research of myself but i know the the hygiene hypothesis i think is the name for it the idea that as we've increasingly got into more and more sterile environments our immune systems have suffered from that because we've not encountered the sort of diversity and the types of bacteria from dirt and from mud that we always have done and it hasn't sort of allowed us to calibrate our immune systems in the right way. I think you'd find people arguing points on either side of that, but I, that's definitely something people are looking into at the moment. But one thing I do know is in terms of contact with environmental microbes, there are studies that show that um, Japanese populations compared to American populations have microbes that are able to digest seaweed, basically, because it's a massive part of the Japanese diet and not a massive part of the American diet. And they've actually showed that those seaweed genes that digest seaweed, they have come from the environment. So they didn't evolve inside the gut. They evolved in marine ecosystems. And then they at some point must have been transferred from those marine bacteria into our gut bacteria. So 
at some point there, contact with the environment, contact with the sort of dirty microbes was incredibly important. And it might be incredibly important an awful lot. We don't really know at the moment. Yeah. Well, we've three more talks uh, and our next speaker is Elena Pagder. Uh, her talk is called Plastic Not So Fantastic. Uh, she's originally from California and she traveled to Galway to finish her MSc in marine conservation and biodiversity. Uh, she's currently an IRC funded PhD candidate uh, in Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, looking at microplastics in Galway Bay's sedimentary and fauna. Uh, Elena okay, uh, enjoys the occasional sunrise swim and elaborate hot pots. So I'm going to ram in as many stupid puns in as I can. What, you don't think they're good? I'm out. Uh, let's hear it from Elena. Her talk is about plastic. Will it be drastic or fantastic? Let's see. Elena. I just got back into the house and it was completely flooded. So my housemate and I were trying to bail ourselves out, but it wasn't working. And when we went to go see where the water was coming from, it turned out that the tap had been open for 70 years. So he's trying to turn that off and we'll figure out what to do next. That, my friends, is exactly the state of the earth with the amount of plastics we've made. In 2018, Europe produced almost 62 million tons of plastic, which is roughly the same weight as 8 million elephants. Sure, we can just reduce, reuse, and recycle our way out. It's not that simple when it comes to plastics. For metal and glass, these can be re-recycled over and over with almost no new input. But for plastics, even when they are recycled, you always need new material. And over 99% of the time, this new material is sourced from fossil fuels. Of the 62 million tons, most were used for packaging. Now, plastics for packaging are designed to have a short lifetime, which isn't to say they disappear after a short amount of time, but we use them for a short amount of time, like a sandwich bag or a to-go cup. And even though we've gotten better at recycling things like plastic bottles, Things like cling film or mixed plastics are not recyclable, and what isn't recyclable ends up in the landfill, incinerated, or can be in the environment. Now, I just went for a lovely seaside stroll, and on, upon finishing my snack, I took my apple core and my water bottle and threw it in the water. The apple core, with the help of the sun and the wind and the rain and the bacteria, will eventually decompose like if I had left it in the garden, but it's going to take a bit longer. For my water bottle, it might sink to the seafloor, and in 500 years or more, it could disintegrate, or with the help of the sun and the wind and the rain and the bacteria, it could get broken up into microplastics. And these are tiny pieces of trash that pollute the marine environments and can end up being eaten by the fish that we like to eat, which isn't great for their health or ours. It is impossible for us to reclaim these pieces for recycling because of their small size and contaminated state. It would be like looking for grains of sand in a pile of dirt just to make a beach. And there are efforts to stop this plastic leakage, but what, besides recycling, one of the ways we might do this would be the use of bacteria, fungi, and little critters that can actually eat plastic. But we shouldn't be reliant on bacteria and bugs to do our dirty work. Instead, we need to turn off the tap to plastics and not only reduce, reuse, and recycle, but refuse non-essential single-use items, plastic, and rethink our relationship with what we consume so that we can start rebuilding our flooded home. Yes, indeed, Elena. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's hear from our um, judges. Niall, Judith, Gillian, what have we got to say? Elena, can I can I come in there? Well done. That's a great talk and um, fascinating. And can I just ask about the use of bacteria and fungi? I know it's not ideal, and obviously we want to try and you know change our ways as much as possible. But how much research has gone into that, and how viable is it? So there's a lot of projects uh, right now looking at the different bacteria that can consume the plastics, but it's re really for only a specific kind of plastic. It's usually PET which is the most easily recycled plastics. So it's not really helping us out for things that we can recycle, but there's lots of research going into finding out what enzymes are actually breaking down the plastic. And if it's related to just the gut bacteria of the critters or the bacteria or the fungi, or it's um, more uh, elaborate than that, but I'm not researching that. So I can't, I can't really give you what you want. I'm sorry. No, good answer though, thank you. <laughs> Niall, too.
Niall or Gillian, do we have any? Have we lost our judges? No, I, well, you had lost me. I was on, I was on mute, uh, uh, not intentionally. So apologies. Um, so it's a really good talk, Lane. Thank you so so much for that. Just in terms of um, other uh, in the short term, other alternatives to uh, you mentioned that with the single use plastic. Are there other things when we've seen people use, you know, cardboard or 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 or, or wood based things? Are there viable alternatives or are we a long way from that? Or is there a lot of research into those? What's your kind of sense on that? And apologies if that's not directly along the lines working on at the minute, Elena. I would say there is a lot of research going into different kinds of packaging that we could be using. So you'll see things like uh, algae-based packaging for water, which will dissolve in a few hours, which is pretty amazing. Um, But plastics are fantastic for the use that they are way lighter than any glass or metal. So it really helps us out for transporting things, but we need to rethink about how we move materials around and what actually needs to be wrapped in plastic and what can be wrapped in banana leaves or coconut husks or things like this. Any other questions from our judges? Yeah, quick one from me, Elena. Well done. Um, I just, you know, you're absolutely right. We do need to rethink, um, redesign, re- you know, the whole thing. But in terms of what's already in the system, particularly the microplastics, which is the focus, I guess, of what you're researching, um, what is the best solution at the moment in terms of is there any way to retrieve microplastics, break it down, et cetera? I would say we we shouldn't be focusing on microplastics reclamation. We should really be focusing on stopping uh, any more addition of plastics into the environment. Because once we can figure out how to stop all of this coming in, then we can we have the time to try and figure out how the best way to remove these microplastics from the system. But if we just keep adding new material, we'll be overwhelmed on both sides. So I think that that's the solution we need to head towards right now. Thanks very much, Helena. Great talk. All right. Our ninth speaker is Andrew McGovern. Andrew completed his undergraduate degree in neuroscience and continued it into a research-based master's in UCC. Uh, Andrew is currently a teaching assistant focused on biosciences at UL. He's passionate about science communication, higher level education, and neuroimmunology. Neuroimmunology is a field that studies the interaction of the immune and nervous systems. Let's hope he's immune to the judge's criticism and not too nervous to deliver his talk which is called Don't Be Shy, The Important Difference Between X and Y. Yeah, all this talk about equality, I don't think men and women are equal. Whoa. Now, before you log on, find and burn me on Twitter, please hear out my tale. I swear it's a winner because we are not equal. And I think you will find by the end of this talk, I will have changed your mind. Now, it's not quite black and white, but it's not just our names. For between our legs, glory, as... (laughs) any would claim, but there may lie the secret that sets us apart. It may make us stronger, our funny fun parts. So let me tell you a tale, it's short, don't fret, about how we were all but a man, but we now regret. The year was 10,000 years ago until 2012. A doctor would learn all about disease, how to make you better, and how to cure a sneeze, and oh, what information, but how did we know? Did we just throw drugs at it until the sneeze disease froze? Well, we looked in the lab, and then we brought it to people, but... A mistake. We missed half the people. These tests were in men and there wasn't much else to do. If it worked for the man, for girls it would do. But there are no differences. We are all the same. Tell that to a 13-year-old being ashamed because when we're that age we get spiked up with drugs. It changes our body and we get love bugs. And these are our hormones, those changes you see. But what if the monsters were changing disease? Men get testosterone to get big and strong. Wrong. Addiction and Parkinson's stringing more men along. And women get estrogen each and every month. For 40 odd years it gives them a thump. And it may have its benefits, but tis also a curse. Arthritis and lupus, they get women worse. Multiple sclerosis, twice the women as men. A line must be drawn, a link between them. They are autoimmune. What is that? (laughs) You will see. But first I must discuss immunity. Now, immune cells of the body are bouncers of the blood, roaming cell to cell, asking, do you have the ID you should? (laughs) But as we get old, IDs can't be repaired. Those bouncers get mad, and it's us that they tear? That's autoimmune. 
What does this have to do with women? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm getting there. See, estrogen seems to get these bouncer cells pumped. Maybe to fight infection for a baby bump. Hmm. Is there anything that might affect me? Well, I got through two minutes without saying COVID-19. And yes, it is true. Seven in ten deaths are in men. Maybe the bouncer cells are less hyped in them. But don't think for a second, oh, so I'll be okay? Because COVID-19 does try to take you away. Now, before falling off topic, let's make this clear. Research in women is nowhere near. The research in men is years ahead, far ahead, but information is there and a lot I have said. And the future is bright and there's much to be done. I hope you learn something new and are having socially distant fun. Wow. Well done, Andrew. I have to say, we've, we've broken some definite firsts in uh, the history of Fame Lab. We've never had a man talk to his own self, uh, his own hand dressed in a sock. Uh, and we haven't had uh, a rhyming uh, version of a talk uh, all the way through. Absolutely brilliant. Very creative. Uh, let's hear from our judges. Sorry. I, yeah, I, that, I was not expecting that at all. And very, very engaging. Um, I, I don't know if it's a question so much as um, <laughs> <laughs> just a really interesting take on the, the idea that I guess, you know, there hasn't been that much research. We tend to apply um, a lot of science very uniformly across gender and I guess very other, many other sort of ways of defining human. But, um, you know, what I guess for me, I'm still slightly kind of like wowed by, by the rhyme. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering sort of, you know, where, where this, how do you take this forward? How do you fill those gaps? In, in the knowledge, you know, in terms of like... Oh, know. yeah. Well, it's honestly, it's a game of catch up. And uh, there's a lot of people who have been making kind of claims that we need to do so much research just in women and look at that and really catch up and throw it all there. But we really need to be looking at men and women at the same time, because that's the only way we're actually going to find out where the differences are. We need to look at drugs, how they affect men and women. We can't... We it, The problem was just looking at men, uh, because there was a horrible concept or idea that women were just men that went wrong so if we look at something in men then we'll be able to treat it better so the, the idea is that we need to focus so much more on just looking at both spending more time doing more research in, into both Niall yeah I mean I, I'm, 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 I'm probably uh, trying to ask a question that doesn't sound wrong given that we've introduced the whole gender and so on in things now and I get myself into trouble um, th th there is this kind of sense, I, I know, in the in the so the, the astronomy or the, the astronautics community that women are better at at surviving extremes um, more so than men, both psychologically and actually in many ways physiologically. Any sense of that from what you've been looking at? That not only have we not been looking at uh, equally at the two sexes, but that we've actually been missing some fundamental strengths by looking at the weaker of the sexes. Uh Absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with that because there's so many strengths that like, I think we have a very societal outlook of men having so many strengths on so many things. And we have that focus, but there hasn't been enough focus on the strengths that women have. And a lot of that is purely because we haven't looked into it. And since we haven't looked into it, how are we meant to know? So I think looking more into how the physiological advantages that women have, of which there are many, the more we look into it, the more we can move forward and the more we can throw them up to bigger heights like space. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Judith, did you have Andrew, a question? Yeah, no, I do. Thanks, Jonathan. Andrew, fabulous. Really good. I love the, um, the rhyming. Very creative. Can I ask, in terms, of, um, in terms of the research you've done and the history of medicine, when do women mm. start to feature more in the research field? When does it become a little bit more equal? Oh, that's a, that, is a, that is a question with an answer that nobody will like because it's far more recent than you'd like. So you're talking in the 1990s was the first time that it actually became mandatory that you were meant to have in clinical studies looking at men and women, okay? Because And there, that was up into the 90s and you had disasters throughout the 60s and 70s of all these drugs that came out that let's say there was a classic one called thalidomide that was used to treat morning sickness. That was its goal, but all of the testing was in men. 
So the first time it hit women was when it hit the market and then it caused birth defects. So it wasn't until 1993 that that actually came into like the mainstream. And honestly, it took a little longer to follow suit. It wasn't until 97 to 2000 that we started pulling drugs off the market that had adverse effects on women. And in the very earliest state of testing, where we're in preclinical, when we're in the lab, it wasn't until 2016 that we finally said, right, now you have to be looking at both male and female cells, male and female animals, when we're doing these preliminary tests. So the answer is, Bad. It's way too recent. And that's how far behind we are. And you're even seeing it now. People are in such shock of the coronavirus is affecting men and women differently. How does that happen? And the answer is we should know, but we don't because it's been put to the side. That's fascinating. Thank it, you. Absolutely fascinating subject. And, and like, and even when it comes to how we prescribe drugs um, as well, if we think of Miriam O'Callaghan and Shaquille O'Neal, uh, they get the same dose of paracetamol mm -hmm. when they have a headache. So, um, it's all kind of strange. Andy, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we come to our ultimate speaker, Luca Miramin. Uh, his talk is about genetics. Uh, he has lived, studied, and worked in Italy, the UK, South Africa, and leaving the best till last, Ireland, where he is a lecturer in aquatic ecology at the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, our second speaker from there this evening. Uh, Luca's research uses DNA to study life in water, ranging from sea squirts to whales. And his talk in the fame like Galway Heat was about aliens, not little green men, but invasive species that are transported out of their natural habitat to dominate their new surroundings. Will that be a metaphor for Luca in the final, transported out of his lab in Galway to take part in this fame lab final? Will he thrive in this hostile environment? Will it be kill or be killed? Survival of the fittest. Please welcome our final speaker, Luca Merriman. I want to share a childhood memory of mine that goes back more than 30 years. I clearly remember the sound of crickets, frogs, and the night owls, filling the air of the warm summer nights in the Po River Delta. Sadly, those animals are no longer there, and the summer nights back home have gone silent. This is a global reality, though. Of 8.5 billion species estimated on the planet, 1 million are under threat of extinction. And the way we are exploiting natural resources has definitely something to do with it. See, natural systems are like finely tuned clocks made of millions of interconnected cogs, which we call species. Homo sapiens, humans, are just one but very special cog, and understanding how it can fit and coexist in such complex systems is indeed no easy task. Luckily, scientists have come up with revolutionary ways of studying life on Earth, such as environmental DNA, which is DNA in the environment. DNA is in cells within your body, right? But did you know that your DNA constantly leaves your body? In fact, by the end of this three minutes, you will have lost about 100,000 dead skin cells. That is nine pounds of skin a year. And those cells contain your unique genetic signatures, which will persist in the environment for days, weeks, or even longer. But here's the catch. This must be true for all species on Earth, meaning that Trillions of cells are trickling away from plants and animals all over the globe. It's like our planet is infused with the scent of life. Detecting environmental DNA works particularly well in water systems such as lakes, rivers and the ocean. And in fact, using highly sensitive DNA technology and small volumes of, of water samples such as this one, we can detect hundreds in, and even thousands of species such as alien invasive sea squirts, wild Atlantic salmon, elusive humpback whales, without catching or even seeing them. And this is possible thanks to common genes known as barcoding genes that work just like barcodes and food products. Every species has them, but each is unique, so we can tell DNA traces apart when they are mixed together in samples such as that one. So, if we look closely, we can detect traces of those specific unique signatures and get a snapshot of diversity of life in the ocean from a bottle. And that's how environmental DNA is revolutionizing the way we are studying and understanding natural system on a global scale. So I'm going to leave you with another, another memory of mine. Recently I've heard that sound of bursting wildlife once again in the South African Cape Floristic region. So if we start using natural resources wisely, it is not too late to fit that Homo sapiens cog 
in that wonderful clock that is life on Earth. Thank you. Well done, Luca Miriamin, our final Fame Lab contestant. Let's go to the judges one final time. Really well done, Luca. That's fascinating. And it, it just actually confirms to me how we're all connected. If there's trillions of cells coming from all different plants and animals. Um, can you talk us through a little bit of that, like in, in terms of how you, what, what your research has looked into in particular? Is there any particular types of um, DNA signatures that you've looked at? Yeah, well, uh, there, there are two main ways that at the moment DNA can be looked at. We can either use techniques that uh, target sp specific organisms or species specific, so just a whale or a sea squirt. Uh, and there are other techniques that will target uh, using universal uh, markers, they're called, uh, that target whole groups of taxa or many different organisms together. Um, and I'm using both. And generally, there are two main groups of, of target organisms that I look at. There are some that they are ecologically important, say that they're important because they are threatened or are uh, under threat of extinction for cons conservation concern, such as marine mammals. Uh, and then there are those that they are uh, of commercial importance, such as uh, fisheries, uh, and like salmon uh, and other fish species, or bivalves like mussels, oysters. So the applications of these techniques are, are really countless. They can look for distribution, can, they can look for uh, spawning events, they can look for many different things and they're on, this is only the tip of the iceberg because the, the application really comes with. Um, so li literally, I don't know, what, I, I still don't know which angle to take because everything seems so interesting uh, to look at. All you need is to collect a sample of water. Niall, no, Gillian? Yeah, um, Luca, thank you. Uh, it's a really lovely end thought, actually, that you've, you've left us all with, um, the idea that we can find our the, the human cog back in, in this lovely complex picture. Um, just a question about the research. The DNA, presumably the presence of DNA in the environment gives you an indication of what species are present. Um, but can it give you more detail than that? I mean, you mentioned just now, for example, spawning events. Can you tell what part of the organism the DNA may have originated from? Um, you know, can you give it more detail in terms of what behavior may have been occurring at the time? Um, I'm just interested in how much detail you can get out of environmental DNA. Okay, so at the moment, uh, many studies have shown that detecting presence, absence of DNA is it's working and it's you know great applications and works better than uh, in, for some organisms and some, some environments than others, but it works quite well. Uh, the next steps are looking at, at biomass, for instance, see, is there a correlation between amount of DNA that is in the water and how much fish there is in a certain area? Uh, others is to look more at the interest specific, like not just species level, is that species there, but also look at diversity of populations from an, an environmental mix sample. Um, Others are looking at, you know, presence of DNA does not necessarily mean that the, the organism is alive. For instance, a dead fish could release a lot of DNA. So we look at eRNA now, because that also shows that it is bioactive, so it's actually alive. That's very, very relevant for when you're looking at invasive species, for instance. You want to know whether there's traces in it or, or, or is actually still alive and viable, the organism. Um, and, and, and the way it's going, it's really... I think it's hard to imagine, for instance, uh, I was listening to Helen's talk about, you know, the way that DNA degrades as uh, it goes on and you can look at telomeres and other structure. Perhaps we can detect those in the environment, say how old the population is or the average population is. So th there is a, really the application of countless, but uh, uh, there is also so many factors that can affect uh, how long it persists and can affect how the limit of detection of this technique. So, it is, it is really um, difficult to tell which way it will go, but it is showing great potential. Uh, in terms of, um, just to mention some examples of how creative this research can, can be, uh, scientists now are using, for instance, leeches, uh, blood-sucking organs, they look like a worm that sucks some blood, in, in tropical forests, and they extract DNA from their blood to see what they preyed upon, and they actually detect 
rare mammals from the forests without seeing them. Um, or they use marine sponges, that they are actually natural filter feeders for looking for DNA of all fish that can be found within a sponge, which is filtering water all the time. So these are just examples how creative this research will become. Luke, thank you very much. And thank you very much to our judges. Congratulations again to all 10 of our Fame Lab finalists for delivering excellent talks. But it is now time to pick a winner. Uh, so we will say goodbye to our three judges, Gillian Burke, Judith Moffat, and Niall Smith. We'll see them back in about 15 minutes. And uh, while they're going off deliberating, let me give you a recap of all of our finalists so that you at home can vote too. And we'll be giving you the results of that in the comments section of this Facebook Live feed uh, when a winner has been announced. So they are, uh, first off was Helen Horkin. Her question, uh, her talk was about immortal cells. She was speaker number one. If you liked her, vote for her. Uh, Connor Duffy talked about how human beings are adapted to run. He's number two. And uh, number three was Sandra Hurley. Her talk was called Don't Fence Me In. It was about the welfare of horses. At number four was Simon Spichak. He said uh, that we were all zombies and hosts to our microbes. If you liked his horror show, uh, vote for him. That's number four. Marina Mulligan talked to us about birdsong bioacoustics. She's number five. Our sixth speaker was Katie Burns. She talked about wasps and why they are not as bad as everyone might think. That's number six. Number seven, Joseph Pennycook uh, talked about uh, the way our families come together and, and talked about lichen and uh, as well about how our uh, bacteria and, uh, and uh, microbiome is connected in, in a weird and wonderful way. He was number seven. Uh, eight was Elena Pachter, our uh, Californian, talking about uh, microplastics and what we can do about them in the environment. Uh, nine was Andrew McGovern. Uh, Andrew gave uh, a rhyming talk uh, where he talked to a puppet about the uh, importance of matching female and male studies in science and medicine. And our final speaker was Luca Mirman, who talked about environment, environmental DNA and how we might be able to use it to understand Earth a little bit more. They are our 10 FameLab Ireland finalists. So on your screen now, you should see a URL and a QR code that will allow you to vote for your favorite FameLab Ireland winner and to take you through the prizes. So you at home get to vote for uh, the audience prize and the winner is a lockdown gift bag. I'm not quite sure what's, what's in that, it might be PPE. Um, Third place uh, wins a, a voucher of 314 euro. Second place wins an iPad. And third place wins a 1.618 thousand euro. Uh, see if you can figure out the scientific reasons of why we chose a 314 euro voucher for the third place and 1,618 euro for the first place uh, prizes. So some serious prizes as well for the winner uh, as representing Ireland in the international final. Uh, which won't be taking place at Cheltenham, but it will be part of the Chain Lab, at the Cheltenham Festival's live event. Uh, so good luck to all of our participants. Please take part in voting. We will let you know who the winner is in the Facebook Live comments. It's now time to uh, sit back and relax and enjoy a previous winner um, of Fame Lab. Uh, this is Emer McGuire. She's a TEDx performing musical co comedian, an international award-winning science communicator, and a double Irish radio award-winning radio presenter. Her debut show, Ema Maguire, Hilarious Humans, had a sellout run in the 2019 Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and she's a presenter of science and stuff on BBC Radio Ulster. Ulster. Uh, it all began when Ema won Fame Lab in 2015 with a talk on the science of love. She then went on to win International Science Stars in 2017. I could go on and on, but I'd much prefer hear Ema Maguire. Please welcome her to Fame Lab Ireland. Hi everybody, I'm Emer McGuire and thank you so much for having me as part of the Fame Lab Ireland final. I know this is an incredibly unusual way to be having the final, but I really hope everybody's keeping safe and healthy and happy during this uncertain time. It's also very weird coming to you from a, a room in my house, but this is quite cool. Um, I've been watching the final so far, I'm sure, and I'm also sure that everyone will have been absolutely amazing. Um, I feel like I've watched so many Fame Labs over the years, and the Irish final always amazes me. I feel like there's so much talent on this island, so thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, I usually like to tell people a little bit about myself, things like this, just so you guys can get to know me. And... 
Do you know what this is like? Actually, I can't get this thought out of my head. This is kind of like it's back in the day and I'm doing like a two camera getting to know me video for like a weird dating agency or something. Um, but the reason the reason I'm here at FameLab is because I'm a past FameLabber myself. So back in 2015, which seems like an absolute lifetime ago, it seems forever ago, I won FameLab UK and I've kind of been in love with science communication ever since. But what I also love is writing music, so I thought I could leave the complicated science to you guys and join you for a bit of a light-hearted musical interval set with a couple of scientific facts thrown in for good measure. Basically see if I can cheer everybody up a little bit given, as I say, the weird times that we're in. Um, So to give you a little bit of an insight into who I am, I kind of started to ask people around me, family, friends, sent out messages and said, look, I want to write this song introducing myself um what words come into your head whenever you think about me and I was kind of expecting you know the classics like hilarious charming adorable um but the one that consistently came out on top was socially awkward Uh, I know I I don't get it either I'm an absolute delight but people kind of said that over and over again so I thought do you know maybe it's true people are probably saying it for a reason so I started to look into the science behind being socially awkward to see if there was anything in it um, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of hoping it was going to be like that whole thing. If one sense was dulled, you know, and other would be heightened, um, and it kind of is the case. So there's actually a psychologist called Tai Tashiro who discovered that people who are socially awkward have some specialist skills. Um, and let's be honest, guys, this is a science competition. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only socially awkward one here. Am I right? And. This psychologist found that socially awkward people see things differently, which can be an advantage. They can have a different perspective. He also found that research shows that socially awkward people excel in science, technology and maths. So if we didn't know that. Um, And finally, that what people lack in social skills, they make up for in striking, intense talent in one area. I thought that was so cool. I loved that. Um, But for me kind of in the true style of not fitting in, in terms of being socially awkward. I don't really have an intense striking talent in one area. What I do have, though, is a guitar. So I thought I could write my introductory song based on that. And this is about some of the kind of socially awkward situations that I found myself in during the course of my lifetime. I hope some of you fellow fame labbers out there can identify with this. This is socially awkward. Part one of 47. Socially awkward, it's like my brain is sick, my normalness gets blurred when I'm out in public. I giggle at funerals, think that it's okay to just smile and nod, even though I cannot hear you. Please don't ask me a question, and cause I have got no idea what we're talking about. Ow, ow. One time I walked into a shop, didn't have what I needed in stock But now I can't leave without buying anything That would only look suspicious, my paranoia is fictitious I don't care, I spend a fortune on things I don't need I buy some milk and I'm lactose intolerant I'm gluten free and I bought seven loaves of wheat and bread I bought some cigarettes, I don't even know how to smoke I should have walked out of the shop instead, I'm socially awkward It's like my brain is sick, my normalness gets blurred when I'm out in public I giggle at funerals, stiffen when you praise me Think it's okay to say, your ma seems why lazy If she's really lazy Why would I say she's not? She seems pretty lazy So now I'm trying to leave my work But up ahead I see some jerk Smiling and holding the door for me I alternate between run and walk I hope he doesn't try to talk This weird shuffle's making it look like I need to pee But I just say thanks And he holds open another door I say thanks again and think Oh no, I've been trapped here before If we don't break the cycle, this will never end So I jump out the nearest window Thanks a lot, my friend I'm socially awkward It's like my brain is sick My normal just gets blurred When I'm out in public I giggle at funerals Stephen, when you hug me Think it's okay to say 
that baby's ugly if it's really ugly why would i say he's cute he's clearly ugly i'm socially awkward so i think in terms of being socially awkward i feel like there's a little bit of a reason why people think that i'm a little bit weird um So I say weird, people usually say, and if if you've got this before, this is the same thing. People usually say, oh, Emer's Emer's very quirky, isn't she? Very quirky. Um, I know they mean weird. It's fine. (laughs) But I feel like that all kind of started for me in childhood. Um, I feel like I had quite a pretty bad start in life. So whenever I was about two and a half, okay, I kind of developed these weird symptoms Um, and when my brother was two and a half he developed the same thing and the symptoms included things like being ignored by our parents or kind of having these constant feelings of mediocrity Um, and it turned out we were both middle children. Um, I wonder if there's anybody here in the group who performed today that's a middle child. I'm guessing yes because it's a very middle child thing to get up and demand attention on a stage for any amount of minutes um, so I'm guessing we've got a few but middle child syndrome was actually suggested by a psychologist in the early 20th century who thought yes this is a definite syndrome and he said that anyone who wasn't the oldest child or the youngest child counted as a middle child um, there's even a middle child day did you know that no nobody cares it's August 12th uh, I keep telling my parents every year keep ignoring me so you have to look back and think, why do middle children feel left out? So the oldest get the privileges and responsibilities by virtue of being the oldest. The youngest get babied and spoiled. And then the middle child has no clear role in the family. Um, and I always think about it, you know, my parents would say about my big sister, and this is the eldest child. We're so proud of her. She's getting the keys to the farm, you know, She is going to carry on our family's belief, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then about my wee brother, the baby. Och, and Sean's the wee baby. Isn't he adorable? Isn't he lovely? He's about six foot three and he's 24. How lovely is he? He's a lovely wee thing. Um, Nobody has ever said about me or my other brother. And these are the middle ones. Nobody says a thing. Uh, I think they've forgotten we exist. But the guy who suggested middle child syndrome said that the lack of parental attention that you receive as a middle child makes you more likely as an adult to fight injustice, which I thought was so cool. Um, In fact, more more than half of the US presidents to date have been middle children. It's a pretty good way to get your parents' attention, isn't it? But I wanted to look for studies that talked about the positivities associated with being a middle child. And one study said that middle children are more likely to be socially strong and have flourishing careers. And guys, I have to say, like, flourishing is not the F word that my dad used when I said I was going to, you know, pursue a career in musical scientific comedy. Um, But I decided to write a song about all the things I have experienced as a middle child to kind of rise up against the injustices of always being this kind of pale from standing in your sibling's shadow, um, of always having to sit in that middle seat in the back of the car when you were away. That was definitely the job of a middle child. So I hope some of you can identify with this. This is middle child syndrome. You know that you're the middle child If every time your mother smiled Around you, you both knew She was thinking about the other two You know that you're the middle child If when your family all played hide and seek It was a week before they noticed you were gone at all You know that you're the middle child If every time your dad called your name without shame You'd say Catherine, Mary, Connor, Sean, Sarah, Susan, Kara, John, Mary, Joseph, Toto, Ben What's your name again? Little children full of crippling self-doubt and jealous rage Little children unfairly disliked because of birth order and age And we'll never understand why we're vilified Until we have our own kids and we hate our own metal child You know that you're the 
middle child If any time you ever cried Your mum took you aside and said I'll give you something to cry about Even though you'd broken both your legs Your parents didn't really care But they brought your sister to Andy When she got chewing gum in her hair You know that you're the middle child If you showed your parents this song And they both laughed along And told you that it wasn't wrong Middle children full of crippling self-doubt and jealous rage Middle children unfairly disliked because of birth order and age And we'll never understand why we're vilified Until we have our own kids and we hate our own metal child um, so that's kind of a little bit of an insight into the mind of a middle child and like I say I hope a couple of you do identify with that so finally thank you so much for sticking with us so far um, finally given the time that we're in I wanted to talk just for, for a tiny second about you know loneliness and lockdown I know people are having a really hard time at the minute and I once read a really interesting study about the power of music on the mind Um, And it was a study by a psychologist called Hanser and her study focused on looking at the connection between music and scores of anxiety and depression in older, sometimes isolated adults. Um, And what her study did was it split groups of adults into three groups. One group got full music therapy, one group got diluted music therapy and one group got no music therapy. Um, And in both groups who got music therapy, there, there was a dramatic decrease and their anxiety and depression scores, um, and those those uh, scores lasted long term. And for me, I just think the fact that music has been proven to make us feel good. Um, there there are lots of studies talking about the fact that music lowers your stress. Stress levels can even improve levels of immunoglobin A antibody in your saliva. It can um, improve your blood pressure, um, help with anxiety and general well-being. I think given the fact that music has been proven to make us feel good and given the fact that we're in lockdown, I could play a song linking those things. So one day into lockdown, I was very, very bored and I was trying to figure out things that I could do around the house to keep occupied and I started to write a list of those things and then I thought why don't I put this in a song um so it's a song about ideas for things that you could do to keep occupied and this one is literally just for the happiness factor um this is lockdown I really hope you enjoy this so we're in lockdown stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Call up your sister, tell her she's got class FaceTime your granny and agree it's terrible to cancel the mass WhatsApp your brothers, check their money's doing fine Text your dad and suggest he pours your mother a glass of wine Organize your cupboards, find some random herbs and spices Discover you'll still never use that chimerick in this crisis Look down the sofa for an extra bit of cash We'll need it when this is over and we're all out on the lash We're in luck down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Go on and cut your fringe, she have always wanted binds Who cares if it goes wrong, no one will see you're ostracised Have a major Netflix binge, maybe learn to dance Eat Doritos for your dinner while you're chilling in your pants Act out scenes of movies with your dog playing the lead Or pretend you're in Crufts and he'll win best and breed Or get out your playing cards, have a game of snap Maybe don't need some toilet roll unless you're full of crap We're in luck down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside Try some online yoga, learn to speak say Gather up your friends and have a Facebook live soiree Open up your wardrobe and have a fashion show Look into the mirror and tell yourself you're beautiful Do a hundred push-ups, iron everything in sight Eat your body weight in chocolate, tell yourself you'll be alright Maybe make a scrapbook, learn to play the violin WhatsApp your football teammates while you're knocking back the gin We're in luck down, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been So here's some ideas to keep you occupied To keep our souls happy while we're hanging out inside 
Write a song about a virus that's trying to ruin the world Stealing hopes and lives and money but it won't keep down this Irish girl If we all just pull together, keep each other entertained Won't be long till we are out there dancing in the rain We're in lockdown, stuck in quarantine I'm socially distant but I think I've always been Just keep your head up, wash your hands and keep combined Stay apart and stick together, most importantly, be kind Thank you so, so much for watching. Um, I've been Emer Maguire. A massive, massive good luck to everyone who performed tonight. And also a massive thank you to FameLab for having me. Hopefully I'll get to see all of you in person someday. Thank you. And I, I absolutely can guarantee you, if you ever go to see Emer Maguire uh, at a live gig, you'll absolutely love her if you, if you get a chance to see her in, in, in person. I saw her at the Northern Ireland Science Festival and she's an absolute treasure. Uh, so thanks very much to Emer. So our judges have been deliberating. They've come back from the judges room and it's time to find out who won FameLab Ireland 2020. Before we do, though, let's find out from our judges exactly how easy it was this year. Judith. Extremely difficult, Jonathan. Really, really hard. It was just so hard deliberating on that. But um, we really enjoyed um, the 10 presentations. And I have to say to each and every one of you, you're a really talented science communicator. So please keep it going and um, just just enjoy yourselves with it because we had a great time. But you left us with an awful decision of trying to choose some um, to narrow it down to three. But um, we got there. We got there in the end. Well, thanks very much, uh, Judith, Gillian, and Niall. Uh, as you know, we're going to be announcing the Facebook uh, winner, the live winner chosen by the audience, and you'll find the winner in the comment section of this video. Uh, so it's just left to me to announce the places three, two, and one. So in third place in this year's FameLab Ireland 2020 final, it was Katie Burns. Congratulations, Katie. Well done. An excellent talk. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was so fun. <laughs> All right. In second place, Marina Mulligan. <laughs> we might ask you to do that again, Marina. We can't hear you. Are you muted? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've just to say that the other group have been amazing. Um, the rest of the talks are so interesting. And I actually think even this year, by being further apart, we've actually become a closer group um, just because we've had more time interacting. So it's been great. Thank you. Well, well done, Marina, and uh, congratulations. It leaves me now uh, just with one final name in front of me, and that is the winner of this year's FameLab Ireland final. Drum roll, please. The winner is Simon Spichak. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations, Simon. Well, thank you. How do you feel? Amazing, that sort of came out of nowhere. It's great. Thank you. So that means you will be representing Ireland at the international final at the virtual Cheltenham Science Festival, Simon. Uh, congratulations, a fantastic talk and a, and a really interesting take on uh, uh, the microbiology of ourselves and, and how it controls us. Uh, so congratulations to all of our FameLab finalists. Thank you so much to all of our judges. And of course, to the main partners, British Council and Cheltenham Festivals, our main funder, Science Foundation Ireland, supporters, CPL and Henkel, and all of the other 20 plus Ireland, uh, uh, FameLab Ireland supporters. We really appreciate all of your effort in putting this together. Um, we're going to leave you with a highlight reel from this year. Congratulations once again to all the participations, the, the participants. We hope to see you at FameLab Ireland next year. In the meantime, enjoy the highlights. Good night and good luck. Fame Lab is an amazing opportunity for anyone who is passionate about telling stories within science, technology, 
engineering or math. Public support for, for research and for science is really important. We need to be able to communicate quickly and quite simply. The sun ain't hot enough. Moving towards a more tactile learning environment will have benefits for every child. So can we still save the world? Well, yes, we can. It's about that connection, and it's one of the most difficult things to craft. This is something that Ireland can be really good at. We're known as a nation of storytellers, and now we're putting the spotlight on science. I think it's a really, really exciting time for science communication. How do we win the battle with disease? May I note the incredibly good coordination of your socks and your t-shirt. Excellent. <laughs> me the confidence to realise that I can speak about my science to people. My favourite thing about the Fame Lab thing is that they give you training at every single step. The skills we learned and were able to develop about public speaking were just invaluable. The whole reason for science is to better humanity. It doesn't better humanity if the rest of humanity doesn't know about it. You're all to be hugely commended for the courage that it takes to stand up and to do what you've done this evening, so really well done.